as I walked out on this summer morning at Lower Lee. Chapter 1 London Road. The stooping figure of my mother, waist deep in the grass and caught there like a piece of sheep's wool, was the last I saw of my country home as I left it to discover the world. She stood old and bent at the top of the bank, silently watching me go, one gnarled red hand raised in farewell and blessing, not questioning why I went. At the bend of the road I looked back again and saw the gold light die behind her. Then I turned the corner, passed the village school, and closed that part of my life forever. It was a bright Sunday morning in early June, the right time to be leaving home. My three sisters and brother had already gone before me. Two other brothers had yet to make up their minds. They were still sleeping that morning, but my mother had got up early and cooked me a heavy breakfast, had stood wordlessly while I ate it, her hand on my chair, and had then helped me pack up my few belongings. There had been no fuss, no appeals, no attempts at advice or persuasion, only a long and searching look. Then, with my bags on my back, I'd gone out into the early sunshine and climbed through the long wet grass to the road. It was 1934. I was 19 years old, still soft at the edges, but with a confident belief in good fortune. I carried a small, rolled-up tent, a violin and a blanket, a change of clothes, a tin of treacle biscuits and some cheese. I was excited, vainglorious, knowing I had far to go, but not, as yet, how far. As I left home that morning and walked away from the sleeping village, it never occurred to me that others had done this before me. I was propelled, of course, by the traditional forces that had sent many generations along this road, by the small, tight valley closing in around one, stifling the breath with its mossy mouth, the cottage walls narrowing like the arms of an iron maiden, the local girls whispering, marry and settle down. Months of restless unease leading to this inevitable moment had been spent wandering about the hills, mournfully whistling and watching the high open fields stepping away eastwards under gigantic clouds. And now I was on my journey, in a pair of thick boots and a hazel stick in my hand. Actually, I was going to London, which lay a hundred miles to the east, and it seemed equally obvious that I should go on foot. But first, as I'd never yet seen the sea, I thought I'd walk the coast and find it. This would add another hundred miles to my journey, going by way of Southampton, but I had all the summer and all time to spend. That first day alone, and now I really was alone at last, steadily declined in excitement and vigour. As I tramped through the dust towards the Wiltshire Downs, a growing reluctance weighed me down. White elder blossom and dog roses hung in the hedges, blank as unwritten paper, and the hot, empty road, there were few motor cars then, reflected Sunday's waste and indifference. High, sulky summer sucked me towards it, and I offered no resistance at all. Through the solitary morning and afternoon, I found myself longing for some opposition or rescue, for the sound of hurrying footsteps coming after me, and family voices calling me back. None came. I was free. I was affronted by freedom. The day silence said, Go where you will. It's all yours. You asked for it. It's up to you now. You're on your own, and nobody's going to stop you. As I walked, I was taunted by echoes of home, by the tinkling sounds of the kitchen, shafts of sun from the windows falling across familiar furniture, across the bedroom and the bed I had left. When I judged it to be tea time, I sat on an old stone wall and opened my tin of treacle biscuits. As I ate them, I could hear Mother banging the kettle on the hob and my brothers rattling their teacups. The biscuits tasted sweetly of the honeyed squalor of home, still only a dozen miles away. I might have turned back then if it hadn't been for my brothers, but I couldn't have borne the looks on their faces. So I got off the wall and went on my way. The long evening shadows pointed to folded villages, homing cows and after-church walkers. I tramped the edge of the road, watching my dusty feet, not stopping again for a couple of hours. When darkness came, full of moths and beetles, I was too weary to put up the tent, so I lay myself down in the middle of a field and stared up at the brilliant stars. I was oppressed by the velvety emptiness of the world and the swathes of soft grass I lay on. Then the fumes of the night finally put me to sleep, my first night without a roof or bed. I was woken soon after midnight by drizzling rain on my face,
the sky black and all the stars gone. Two cows stood over me, windily sighing, and the wretchedness of that moment haunts me still. I crawled into a ditch and lay awake till dawn, soaking alone in that nameless field. But when the sun rose in the morning, the feeling of desolation was over. Birds sang and the grass steamed warmly. I got up and shook myself, ate a piece of cheese, and turned again to the south. Now I came through Wiltshire, burning my roots behind me and slowly getting my second wind, taking it easy, idling through towns and villages, and knowing what it was like not to have to go to work. Four years as a junior in that gaslit office in Stroud had kept me pretty closely tied. Now I was tasting the extravagant quality of being free on a weekday, say at 11 o'clock in the morning, able to scuff down the side road and watch a man herding sheep, or a stalking cat in the grass, or to beg a screw of tea from a housewife and carry it into a wood and spend an hour boiling a can of spring water. As for this pocket of England through which I found myself walking, it seemed to me immense. A motor car, of course, could have crossed it in a couple of hours, but it took me the best part of a week, dreading it slowly, smelling its different soils, spending a whole morning working round a hill. I was lucky, I know, to have been setting out at that time, in a landscape not yet bulldozed for speed. Many of the country roads still followed their original tracks, drawn by pack horse or lumbering cartwheel, hugging the curve of a valley or yielding to a promontory like the wandering line of a stream. It was not, after all, so very long ago, but no one could make that journey today. Most of the old roads have gone, and the motor car since then has begun to cut the landscape to pieces, through which the hunched-up traveller races at gutter height, seeing less than a dog in a ditch. But for me, at that time, everything I saw was new, and I could pass it slowly through the hours of the day. While still only a day's march from home, coming from Malmesbury and Chippenham, already I noticed different shades of speech. Then a day or so later I passed down the Wiley Valley and came out to a vast and rolling plain, a sweep of old dry land covered with shaggy grass which looked as though it had just been cropped by mammoths. Still vague about places, I was unprepared for the delicate spire that rose suddenly out of the empty plain. As I walked, it went before me, gliding behind the curve of the hill and giving no hint of the city beneath it. Just a spire in the grass, my first view of Salisbury, and the better for not being expected. When I entered the city, I found it was market day, square crowded with bone-thin sheep. Farmers stood round in groups, talking sideways to each other and all looking in opposite directions. The pubs were bursting with dealers, counting out crumpled money. Shepherds and dogs sat around on the pavements. Supreme above all towered the misty cathedral, still prince of the horizontal town, throwing its slow, shifting shade across the market square and jingling handfuls of bells like coins. After a week on the road, I finally arrived at Southampton, where I'd been told I would see the sea. Instead, I saw a few rusty cranes and a compressed-looking liner wedged tightly between some houses. Also some sad allotments fringing a muddy river, which they said was Southampton water. Southampton town, on the other hand, came up to all expectations, proving to be salty and shifty in turns, like some ship-jumping sailor who turned his back on the sea in a desperate attempt to make good on land. The streets near the water appeared to be jammed with shops designed more for entertainment than profit, including tattooists, ear piercers, bump readers, fortune tellers, whelk bars and pudding boilers. There was also a shop selling kites and Chinese paper dragons, coloured sands and tropical birds, and lots of little step-down taverns panelled with rum-soaked timbers and reeking of pickled eggs and onions. As I'd been sleeping in fields for a week, I thought it was time I tried a bed again, so I went to a doss house down by the docks. The landlady... An old hag with a tooth like a tin opener said it would cost me a shilling a night, demanded the money in advance, treated me to a tumblerful of whisky, then showed me up to the attic. Early next morning she brought me a cup of tea and some water in a wooden bucket. She looked at me vaguely and asked what ship I was from, and only grunted when I said I'd come from Stroud. Then she spotted my violin hanging on the end of the bed and gave it a twang with her long blue nails. Well, hey diddle diddle, I reckon, she muttered, and skipped nimbly out of the room. Presently I got up and dressed, stuck my violin under my jacket, and went out into the streets to try my luck. It was now or never. 
I must face it now, or pack up and go back home. I wandered about for an hour, looking for a likely spot, feeling as though I were about to commit a crime. Then I stopped at last under a bridge near a station and decided to have a go. I felt tense and shaky. It was the first time, after all. I drew the violin from my coat like a gun. It was here, in Southampton, with trains rattling overhead, that I was about to declare myself. One moment I was part of the hurrying crowds, the next I stood nakedly apart, my back to the wall, my hat on the pavement before me, the violin under my chin. The first notes I played were loud and raw, like a hoarse declaration of protest. Then they settled down and began to run more smoothly and to stay more or less in tune. To my surprise, I was neither arrested nor told to shut up. Indeed, nobody took any notice at all. Then an old man, without stopping, surreptitiously tossed a penny into my hat as though getting rid of some guilty evidence. Other pennies followed, slowly but steadily, dropped by shadows who appeared not to see or hear me. It was as though the note of the fiddle touched some subconscious nerve that had to be answered, like a baby's cry. When I'd finished the first tune, there was over a shilling in my hat. It seemed too easy, like a confidence trick. But I was elated now. I felt that wherever I went from here, this was a trick I could always live by. I worked the streets of Southampton for several days, gradually acquiring the truths of the trade. Obvious enough to old-timers, and simple once learnt, I had to get them by trial and error. It was not a good thing, for instance, to let the hat fill up with money. The sight could discourage the patron, nor was it wise to empty it completely, which would also confuse him, giving him no hint as to where to drop his money. Placing a couple of pennies in the hat to start the thing going soon became an unvarying ritual making sure, between tunes, to take off the cream, but always leaving two pennies behind. Slow melodies were the best, encouraging people to dawdle. Irish jigs sent them whizzing past. But it also seemed wise to play as well as one was able, rather than to ape the dirge of a professional waif. To arouse pity or guilt was always good for a penny, but that was as far as it got you, while a tuneful appeal to the ear, played with sober zest, might often be rewarded with silver. Old ladies were the most generous, and so were women with children, shop girls, typists and barmaids. As for the men, heavy drinkers were always receptive, so were big chaps with muscles, bookies and punters, but never a man with a bowler, briefcase or dog. Respectable types were the tightest of all, except for retired army officers who would bark, Why aren't you working, young man? and then overtip to hide their confusion. Certain tunes... I discovered, always raised a response, while others touched off nothing at all. The most fruitful were invariably the team room classics and certain of the juicier national ballads. Loch Lomond, Wales Wales and The Rose of Tralee called up their supporters from any crowd, as did Largo, Ave Maria, Toselli's Serenade and The Whistler and His Dog. The least rewarding, as I said, was anything quick or flashy, such as The Devil's Trill or Picking Up Sticks, which seemed to throw the pedestrian right out of his stride and completely shatter his charitable rhythm. All in all, my apprenticeship proved profitable and easy, and I soon lost my pavement nerves. It became a greedy pleasure to go out into the streets, to take up my stand by the station or market, and start soaring away at some moony melody, and watch the pennies and halfpennies grow. Those first days in Southampton were a kind of obsession. I was out in the streets from morning till night, moving from pitch to pitch in a gold dust fever, playing till the tips of my fingers burned. When I judged Southampton to have taken as much as it could, I decided to move on eastwards. Already I felt like a veteran, and on my way out of town I went into a booth to have my photograph taken. The picture was developed in a bucket in less than a minute, and has lasted over 30 years. I still have a copy before me of that summer ghost, a pale, oleaginous shade, posed daintily before a landscape of tattered canvas, his old clothes powdered with dust. He wears a sloppy slouch hat, heavy boots, baggy trousers, tent and fiddle slung over his shoulders, and from the long, empty face gaze a pair of eggshell eyes, unhatched and unrecognisable now. A few miles from Southampton, I saw the real sea at last, head on, a sudden end to the land, a great sweep of curved nothing rolling out of the invisible horizon and revealing more distance than I'd ever seen before. It was green and heaved gently like the skin of a frog, 
and carried drowsy little ships like flies. Compared with the land, it appeared to be a huge hypnotic blank, putting everything to sleep that touched it. As I pushed along the shore, I was soon absorbed by its atmosphere, new, mysterious, alien, the gritty edge on the wind, the taste of tar and salt, the smell of stale seashells, damp roads, mackintoshes, and the sight of the quick summer storm sliding in front of the water like sheets of dirty glass. The south coast, even so, was not what I'd been led to expect from reading Hardy and Geoffrey Farnell, for already it had begun to develop that shabby shoreline suburbia which was part of the whimsical rot of the thirties. Here were the sea shanty towns, sprawled like a rubbishy tide mark, the scattered litter of land and ocean, miles of tea shacks and bungalows, apparently built out of wreckage and called spindrift or sprite of the waves. Here and there, bearded men sat on broken verandas, painting watercolours of boats and sunsets, while big women with dogs, all glistening with teeth, policed parcels of private sand. I liked the seedy disorder of this melancholy coast, unvisited as yet by prosperity, and looking as though everything about it had been thrown together by the winds, and might at any moment be blown away again. I spent a week by the sea, slowly edging towards the east, sleeping on the shore and working the towns. I remember it as a blur of summer, indolent and vague, broken occasionally by some odd encounter. At Gosport I performed at a barrack room concert in return for a ration of army beef. In front of Chichester Cathedral I played Bless This House and was moved on at once by the police. At Bognor Regis I camped out on the sands where I met a fluid young girl of sixteen who hugged me steadily throughout one long hot day with only a gym slip on her sea-wet body. At Littlehampton, i just collected about 18 pence when I was moved on again by the police. Not here. Try Worthing, the officer said. I did so, and was amply rewarded. Worthing, at the time, was a kind of Cheltenham-on-Sea, full of rich, pearl-choked invalids. Each afternoon they came out in their high-wheeled chairs and were pushed round the park by small hired men. Standing at the gate of the park in the main stream of these ladies, I played a selection of spiritual airs and in little over an hour collected 38 shillings, which was more than a farm labourer earned in a week. Worthing was an end to that chapter, a junction in the journey, and as far along the coast as I wished to go, so I turned my back on the sea and headed north for London, still over 50 miles away. It was the third week in June, and the landscape was frosty with pollen, and still coated with elder blossom. The wide open downs, the sheep nibbled grass, the beach hangers on the edge of the valleys, the smell of chalk, purple orchids, blue butterflies, and thistles recalled the Cotswolds I'd so carelessly left. Indeed, Shanktonbury Ring, where I slept that night, could have been any of the beacons round Painswick or Haresfield. Yet I felt farther from home, by the very familiarity of my surroundings, than I ever did later in a foreign country. But next day, getting back onto the road, I forgot about everything but the way ahead. I walked steadily, effortlessly, hour after hour, in a kind of swinging, weightless dream. I was at the age that which feels neither strain nor friction, when the body burns magic fuels, so that it seems to glide in warm air, about a foot off the ground, smoothly obeying its intuitions. Even exhaustion, when it came, had a voluptuous quality, and sleep was caressive and deep, like oil. It was the peak of the curve of the body's total extravagance, before the accounts start coming in. I was living at that time on pressed dates and biscuits, rationing them daily, as though crossing a desert. Sussex, of course, offered other diets, but I preferred to stick to this affectation. I pretended I was T.E. Lawrence, engaged in some self-punishing odyssey, burning up my youth in some pitiless hadramount eyes narrowing to the sandstorms blowing out of the wadis of Godleming in a mirage of solitary endurance. But I was not the only one on the road. I soon noticed there were many others, all trudging northwards in a sombre procession. Some, of course, were professional tramps, but the majority belonged to the hosts of the unemployed who wandered aimlessly about England at that time. One could pick out the professionals. They brewed tea by the roadside, took it easy and studied their feet. But the others, the majority, went on their way like somnambulists, walking alone and seldom speaking to each other. There seemed to be more of them inland than on the coast, 
Maybe the police had seen to that. They were like a broken army walking away from a war, cheeks sunken, eyes dead with fatigue. Some carried bags of tools or shabby cardboard suitcases. Some wore the ghosts of city suits. Some, when they stopped to rest, carefully removed their shoes and polished them vaguely with handfuls of grass. Among them were carpenters, clerks, engineers from the Midlands. Many had been on the road for months, walking up and down the country in a maze of jobless refusals, the treadmill of the mid-thirties. Then, for a couple of days, I got a companion. I was picked up by the veteran Alf. I turned off the road to set up camp for the night when he came filtering through the bushes. I had seen him before. He was about five feet high and was clearly one of the Brotherhood. He wore a deerstalker hat, so sodden and shredded it looked like a helping of breakfast food, and round the waist of his Macintosh, which was belted with string, hung a collection of pots and spoons. Rattling like a dustbin, he sat down beside me and began pulling off his boots. Well, he said, eyeing my dates with disgust, you're a poor little bleeder, ain't you? He shook out his boots and put them on again. Then he gave my supper another look. You can't live on terrible tack like that. You'll depress the lot of us. What you want is a billy. A boil yourself up. Here, yeah, hang on. Just wait a minute. Rummaging through the hardware around his waist, he produced a battered can, the kind of thing my uncles brought home from the war. Square, with a triangular handle. It was a miniature cauldron. Smoke blackened outside and dark, tannin-stained within. Here, yeah, take it he said. You make me miserable. He started to build a fire. I'm going to bore you a bit of tea and tatters. And that is what he did. We stayed together as far as Guildford, and I shared more of his pungent bruise. He was a tramp to his bones, always wrapping and unwrapping himself, and picking over his bits and pieces. He wasn't looking for work, this was simply his life, and he carefully rationed his energies, never passing a patch of grass that looked good for a shakedown, nor a cottage that seemed ripe for charity. He said his name was Alf, but one couldn't be sure, as he called me Alf, and everyone else. A couple of Alfs got jugged in this town last year, he'd say. Work in the shops, you know, with fish hooks, or... An Alf I knew used to do twenty mile a day. One of the looniest Alfs on the road. He said he got round it quicker, and so he did, but folks got sick of his face. Alf talked all day but was garrulously secretive, and never revealed his origins. I suppose that in the shared exposure of the open road, he needed this loose verbal hedge around him. At the same time, he never asked me anything about myself, though he took it for granted that I was a greenhorn, and gave me careful advice about insulation from weather, flannelling housewives, and dodging the cops. As for his own technique of road work, he wasn't slow out of laziness, but because he moved in a deliberate timetable, making his professional grand tour in a twelve months rhythm, which seemed to him fast enough. During the winter he'd hole up in a London doss house, then restart his leisurely cycle of England, turning up every year in each particular district with the regularity of the seasons. Thus he was the spring tramp of the Midlands, the summer bird of the south, the first touch of autumn to the Kentish world. Indeed, I think he firmly believed that this constancy of motion spread a kind of reassurance among the housewives, so that he was looked for and welcomed as one of the recurring phenomena of nature, and was suitably rewarded therefore. Certainly his begging was profitable, and he never popped through a gate without returning with fistfuls of food, screws of tea, sugar, meat, bones and cake, which he'd then boil in one awful mess. He was clean, down at heel, warm-hearted and cunning and he showed me genuine, if supercilious, kindness. You're a bleeding disgrace, he used to say. Miserable little burden. Alf had one strange habit, a passion for nursery rhymes, which he'd mutter as he walked along. Sing a song of sixpence, pocket full of rye, four and twenty blackbirds, baked in an oven. Bar bar black sheep, have you any wool? Yes, sir, yes, sir, I got plenty. The effect of a dozen of these, left hanging in the air, was enough to dislocate the senses. At Guildford we parted, Alf turning east for the Weald, which for him still lay three months away. So long, Alf, I said. So long, Alf, he answered. Try not to be too much of a nuisance. He passed under the railway bridge and out of my life, a shuffling rattle, 
of old tin cans, looking very small and triangular with his pointed hat on his head and black Macintosh trailing the ground. London was now quite near, not more than a two days walk, but I was still in no particular hurry, so I turned northwest and began a detour around it, rather like a wasp sidling up to a jam jar. After leaving Guildford I slept on Bagshot Heath, all birches, sand and horseflies, which to me seemed a sinister and wasted place, like some vast dead land of Russia. Then next morning, only a few miles farther up the road, everything suddenly changed back again, and I was walking through parkland as green as a fable, smothered with beeches and creamy grass. Every motor car on the road was now either a Rolls-Royce or a Daimler, a gliding succession of silver sighs. Their crystal interiors packed with girls and hampers and erect, topped-hatted men. Previously, I had not seen more than two such cars in my life. Now they seemed to be the only kind in the world, and I began to wonder if they were intimations of treasures to come, whether all London was as rich as this. Tramping in the dust of this splendour, I wasn't surprised when one of the Daimlers pulled up and an arm beckoned me from the window. I hurried towards it, thinking it might be full of long-lost relations, but in fact there was no one I knew. "'Want a pheasant, my man?' asked a voice from inside. We just knocked over a beauty a hundred yards back. A quarter of an hour later I arrived at Ascot. It was race week and I walked right into it. White pavilions and flags, little grooms and jockeys dodging among the long glossy legs of thoroughbreds, and the pedigree owners dipping their long cool necks into baskets of pâté and gull's eggs. I went round to the entrance thinking I might get in, but was stared at by a couple of policemen. So I stared, in turn, at a beautiful woman by the gate, who for a moment paused dazzlingly near me, her face as silkily finished as a Persian miniature, her body sheathed in swathes like a tulip, and her sandaled feet wrapped in a kind of transparent rice paper, so that I could count every clean little separate toe. Wealth and beauty were the common order of things now, and I felt I had entered another realm. It would have been no good busking or touting here, indeed outlandish in such a place. Alf and the tattered lines of the workless were far away in another country. So I left Ascot and came presently to another park, full of oak trees and grazing deer, and saw Windsor Castle standing on its green bay's hill like a battered silver cruet. I slept that stifling night in a field near Stokes Pogis, having spent the evening in the village churchyard sitting on a mossy gravestone and listening to the rooks and wondering why the place seemed so familiar. A few mornings later, coming out of a wood near Beaconsfield, I suddenly saw London at last, a long, smoky skyline, hazed by the morning sun, and filling the whole of the eastern horizon. Dry, rusty red, it lay like a huge flat crust, like ash from some spent volcano, simmering gently in the summer morning, and emitting a faint, metallic roar. No architectural glories, no towers or palaces, just a creeping, insidious presence, its vast, horizontal, broken here and there by a gas holder or factory chimney. Even so, I could already feel its intense radiation, an electric charge in the sky that rose from its million roofs in a quivering mirage, magnetically, almost visibly dilating. Cleo, my girlfriend, was somewhere out there, hoarding my letters, I hoped, and waiting. Also mystery, promise, chance and fortune all I had come to this city to find. I hurried towards it now, impatient, its sulphur stinging my nostrils. I had been a month on the road, and the suburbs were long and empty, and in the end I took a tube. 